that. Hang with us, this is going to be fantastic. So I'm going to go quickly and just in fact, you can each introduce yourselves, which we talked about. So what, Quinn Garcia, you go first. Um, he is the co-founder of Autotech Ventures. Um, he is, I would say, considered a pretty amazing guru and investor in um, Autotech. And why don't you talk about yourself, and then Kent, I'll introduce you right after that. So, Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, Quinn Garcia. I'm one of the managing directors of uh, Autotech Ventures. Um, we focus on mobility startups, so ground transportation startups. Uh, we manage about $500 million in uh, venture capital funds uh, focused on early stage uh, ground, ground transport. Um, our mission as a firm is to build the world's strongest community of people who share our passion for mobility tech. Uh, and the idea is to bring together uh, entrepreneurs and funding and industry experts, and including large corporations, to try to solve the world's most pressing uh, transportation problems. Just the little objective there. So uh, <laughs> now that's awesome. We'll, we're going to talk a lot more of that. And Ken, Ken Helfrich from this little company called uh, General Motors, uh, the chief technology officer, the head of research and development, and he leads their venture group. So delighted to have you. Tell us about yourself. Well, really glad to be here, and thanks for the opportunity. So. At GM, we really believe in a future of zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion. And in order to achieve that, we actually have to bring autonomous, electrified, connected vehicles to the market at scale. And so my job is actually, it's like the best job in the company. And, and org charts never solve a problem, but it tells you the strategy. And this is really critical because my job as CTO has research and development, ventures, and also technology commercialization. So those three things together really gives me the opportunity to take great ideas from outside the company, meld them with the IP that we have inside the company, and actually raise everyone's boat in the industry. And we'll talk some more about that, because there's just a lot happening in the startup world. And I know we're going to talk about that, and I can't wait. Oh, it's going to be awesome. Thank you, Kent. So Mike, our partner at Flex, the president of Flex Automotive. Uh, you have an interesting background, too. It sounds like you two knew each other before in life here. And it's possible. Yeah, so <laughs> please all introduce right. So yourself. hey, my name is Mike Taney. And first of all, before I get started with an uh, introduction, I just want to say thank you. Uh, this uh, uh, partnering with you and the KPMG team and getting this, this now live, and also appreciate the folks on the line. Uh, joining together to talk about innovation, uh, especially here at uh, Flex in our Milpitas location, which has been a kind of a home base of innovation for our company for many years, launching a lot of next generation products. So in terms of my background, I've been in the automotive space for about 34 years. Uh, spent a lot of time working on bringing first generation technologies to market, you know, going back to um, early electric vehicle days for power electronics, uh, the uh, advanced driver assistance systems, ADAS, progressing to autonomous, scalable compute systems, et cetera. So working for Flex and leading our automotive business, we're really focused on helping our customers accelerate next-gen mobility uh, along these same lines. So we are so excited to be a part of that. And uh, we'll talk more about some of the challenges here coming up. Yeah, let's get into it. All right, star studded group, I told you. OK, so let's get brass tactics. So. The startup community, and we're going to have three coming up mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a little bit, but they have these big ideas. They take risk. Um, we'll talk about the venture side of this. But I want to start with you, Kent. And you said something when you and I were chatting earlier about how you think about them and what the General Motors bureaucracy and history and, 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 uh, and how you approach them. Um, I, I, I forgot how you said it exactly. but. I, it's hard to always make them succeed, but you said it in a different way. So talk about the cultural aspect of you finding these amazing companies and what you did with Kyle and, and Cruz, and then integrating them or keeping them apart. What is it like in the behemoth General Motors for, for and, and how you view them and how the startups view you? Well, you know, the, the natural outcome of the integration of a little company into a big company is death. Right? It's the death of either the relationship or the great idea that's, that's in there, right? So, so it's really important to be able to make it easy for each side to say yes. 
And this means accommodation on a large company. Um, you know, companies are not irrational. They, they, they develop for a reason. So there's legal processes, there's purchasing processes, there's all these financial things that are out there that are there for a reason, but they don't support the integration of new ideas very effectively. So what ventures and what R&D is able to do is actually create um, new processes that fit within that same construct for both companies so that it's a win-win. And it makes it very easy for these ideas to gestate and to become something bigger and better. And because we're insiders in the company, and like I've worked on anything that has a wire connected to it in the car, I've worked on it at some point in my career. And so that makes it easy for me to say, here's how we're going to approach this and how it's going to integrate into the fabric of the vehicle and the fabric of the company. And then the other thing that's really important about GM Ventures as a corp, as a corp VC, and, and Quinn will talk a bit about you know, the, the, the rest of the VC ecosystem. Um, what's unique about GM as a corp VC is that we're not interested in buying companies. We're interested in being their first and best customer. And that means taking their ideas, and for, for example, um, UVI is a startup in Israel, under vehicle uh, inspection, U-V-E-Y-E. Is, is, and they have a product that is a, a camera system that you can drive. I have through. met them, by the way. I yeah. met them at uh, EcoMotion. Damn, you're working with them? Well, we went from okay, meeting I'm them. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, we you, I didn't from, know this story. But we went ahead. from meeting them to investing in them in April and putting their product in our dealerships now. And so no in, in, the, in the matter of three months, we were able to meet, invest, become the customer, and actually deploy their product in dealerships and on on-prem on inside of GM. And it's just getting them the knowledge that they need to know um, how to work with us, and we're getting to understand their technology, and it's just taking oh, off. Very so cool. Did you go to Tel Aviv, and, or did they come here, or how did you meet Both. them? Yeah. Both, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, we've, so GM Ventures has offices in Detroit, in Sunnyvale, Toronto, Tel Aviv, okay. um, but we invest globally. Right, of course. So, wow, that is, I did not know that. And so, from, the, from their eyes, okay, so are you the, their ambassador, and do you know how to like, don't open that door, you're gonna get shot at, or I mean, how, how do, do you guide them through the GM system, or do you? We, we, we're their trusted guide through the entire process. Okay. But we let their ideas and their technology shine so that they, are able to learn because we can't intermediate that relationship, right? We want them to get the first-hand customer empathy, you know, and say this is exactly how it's being used. And then, then they're they're making changes over the weekend and redeploying it and saying, try this. This is what you asked for. This is the way it's going to work. And then we say, take that to everybody else. Okay, that's fascinating. And uh, so, Quinn, let's go to you now. So. Uh, Corporate venture capital, and then you have your own venture capital fund. Um, how, first of all, how do you view, not GM, but just in general, corporate um, venture capital versus what you do? And how should people think about the differences? And I think they're profound in some ways, but some there's synergist synergies. So tell us about that. Yeah, so our, so our business model, we, um, so we manage these venture capital funds. Uh, we invest into startups using that capital. Where does the capital come from? Uh, a lot of large corporate VCs are limited partners in the funds that we that we manage. A lot of them invest directly into startups, like like GM Ventures does, and then and then a lot of them also make uh, limited partner investments into VC funds, like like ours. And then they use us as a tool uh, to help them access startup deal flow that they might not be able to access on their own, or may, maybe not be able to access it as soon or as early. Uh, on their own. So we help them with de deal flow. Uh, we help them with market intelligence. So kind of monitoring globally um, mobility tech uh, trends to kind of a, an early warning system uh, for them, if you will, kind of what's who's being born today that's going to be to come the next you know, Tesla or the next Lyft or, or, or what have you. Um, we also help them a lot with, uh, with networking. Um, so a lot, of our, a lot of our corporate LPs, they want to learn from each other. Uh, and so I mentioned earlier, you know, our, our mission as a firm is to build community among, among our LPs and, uh, and the entrepreneurs that we've invested in. So we host various events throughout the year where we bring together uh, these corporate executives, many of which have a corporate VC program, uh, and entrepreneurs that we've invested in, and, and then also other types of LPs like financial institutions, you know, funds of funds and banks and uh, and the like that are that are more kind of financially motivated investors in our funds. So, so we view um, 
corporate VCs as our lifeblood, um, their source of capital for our funds, and then we also end up co-investing. Uh, very frequently with uh, with corporations, many of which are our LPs, but also uh, other other corporations that may not be an LP uh, will co-invest alongside them. I'll get to you in a second, Mike, but I want to talk about uh, the uh, incentives here. So uh, Jim Adler, who you may know, was a keynote speaker here a few years ago. He runs Toyota Research, or the Toyota Ventures, basically, their AI Ventures. And they structured their, they structured uh, their, VC, similar to how yours is structured. So they get, I don't know if they have a carry, but certainly they get the upside of, of the venture. And he's incentivized to do that. Um, I, I was fascinated in, in a, a company like Toyota to do that in many ways is very innovative uh, for them. Does GM, I mean, I think you're worth it. So I mean, let's like, say you pick this Israeli one and it goes big. This guy, if he was an investor, you can tell us some of your economics, hopefully. But do you do it that way at GM? Or how does it look like at GM as the head of uh, ventures? Or should we talk afterwards and all you and I can talk to Mary? <laughs> so so we, we invest in order to become the best and first customer, and, and our goal is to incorporate these technologies into our, our products and services. So the, the financial upside is, is a benefit, but our main metric is really having the, the products that we're proud of to take to market. Okay. And, and our capital is really patient. Okay. And my back office is the best back office you can imagine because I've got world-renowned researchers that, that can go and actually help the, the startup and you know, actually create their idea and, and be able to solve some of the thorny problems that, that are always gonna be faced. So the, the, the finance is good, otherwise you know, we wouldn't have lasted for 12 years and made all the investments that we've had. We've got over 25 portfolio companies, we've had 10 exits, we've made 55 investments. We look at 400 plus companies a year, you know, and, it's, it's continuous and, and having great partners that we share insights and deal flow with is, is the lifeblood of the industry. It's all about relationships and it's all about you know, being transparent and being fast and being clear about what your thesis is. Excellent, excellent. I still think you should get more money. We'll talk to Mary about that later, I'm sure. So, <laughs> no, that's, no, it is, seriously, no, the, the staple of R&D researchers that you can bring and what that means for the startup is, is, is fantastic and it's invaluable, I'm sure, in many ways. So, uh, Mike, I want to bring you in the conversation. So, these great companies show up and they got to make something, right? Or they don't know how uh, to do all, how do you come into this ecosystem and where do you guys play in this? Oh, that's a great question. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about ecosystem first and I'll come back to that. So one of the things that, you know, talking about next gen mobility for us, you know, this, as I mentioned earlier, I've been in this industry for a long time. And this has been such a unique time where this whole approach a number of different transformational elements are all coming together. You know, the first one, I think, and it reflects on the diversity of the group that we have here today, talks about how products are being developed and who's developing. The old way of doing things from a car company, specifying a product to a full service tier one, who goes off and does all the hardware, software, manufacturing, verification, validation, systems integration in the vehicle, et cetera. I mean, those days are going away, right, in many ways. And, uh, and I think when you, th when you look at the next generation mobility, it requires next generation ecosystems to support it. It's a network of innovators that are working together to accelerate technology to market that's safe, reliable, uh, upgradable, et cetera, right? And so that's kind of the, one, of the, one of the key things that are here, and I think it really reflects well on this audience. Uh, I'm happy to have everybody here to talk about this that are part of this new dynamic ecosystem. Uh, that we're putting together uh, as an industry to accelerate these new technologies. So that's one of these transformational elements. You know, the other part, of, of course, when you think about it from a technology standpoint, the acceleration of electric vehicle platforms. It's also transformational ground up thinking in terms of how we're building cars uh, to get together as an industry. Um, also driven by sustainability requirements, et cetera. So, you know, you think about the fast growth, you know, a lot of companies have been playing in this space for so long. Now it's real, right? We know it's real. Everybody's going to do it. Everybody's investing. The other element that I think is also transformational, also coming in at the same time, is uh, the fundamental vehicle architecture. So I've been, you know, I think back to our early days when you a feature is a box, 
Okay, so the company I used to work for, you know, we used to advertise in the 90s little black boxes, right? And each box was a feature. Now these features are in software, all right? The software defined vehicle, you know, you heard uh, multiple references to it today. So the features are defined in software and so the, the architecture in the car has to change as well to support that. So massive scalable computing platforms that are in the vehicle that again enables the, the power of the software defined vehicle that allows the vehicle to be upgradable, uh, constant upgrades, constant connectivity, real time, new features that can be, uh, can be brought into bear. So that's another element. And that leads to OEMs and their transformational thinking about how they want to be a part of that, right? Which means developing software, owning the intellectual property, and not just farming that work out to others. And uh, that drive requires, again, now closing the loop back to where we started, a new ecosystem of partners that can, can collaborate in different ways. And so what Flex does, to back to your question, right, is we enable, we accelerate. Uh, as a uh, supplier, we can, if it's a, somebody's design, okay, we can manufacture that. We've been an EMS supplier for over 50 years, and we can do that fast, high quality, fantastic manufacturing and supply chain technology. Um, if it's on the other side where a customer is looking to buy perhaps an electric vehicle component from us, right, then we'll sell them that, where it's our embedded software in that full system and everything in between. It's a flexible business model of where we can collaborate. So we have a lot of customers that, for example, for example, we will design the complex hardware for a L4 automated driving system, for example. Maybe some of the base software and allow the customer to come in and plug in their feature software, you know, their massive software stacks that are around it. So that's the role that we play for a few examples. And I tell you, the, this transformation element, all of those four factors I just talked about coming together is truly an exciting time to be in this industry. No, that's fabulous, and, we're, and you did a great job of explaining where you sit in the ecosystem and how, how valuable it is. Unfortunately, we, in years past, we got to go look at the labs. I don't know if people were here before. I always say that's where all the kids had the Legos and doing all that, but it was, and you had that little secret compartment back there. I still want to know who's, I, who, who was back there with that door locked. I think it was the Apple car, but that was just my fantasy here. But you don't have to comment on Use that. Use your imagination. There you go. Um, so let's get back to economics a little bit. This is, the topics are sexy, the topics are fun, they're amazing, but you gotta pay for it, you gotta get a return on investment, and, and the investment is massive, so obviously this partnering. How do you focus, and when you, and I know you have your focus, and I wanna, I'll start with you, Kent, we'll, we'll, we'll go, to, go to you, Quinn, and then, and then back to you, Mike, on where do you place your bets with Inflex. So you've got the, the fundamental changes in the powertrain, Okay, I know GM is going fully into electric vehicles, but um, there is a transition. You still have to make ICE vehicles, and who the hell knows with new technologies and other powertrains with hydrogen, and, you know, and it is a global world. Um, you have the amazing automated technologies we're talking about today, and we saw, uh, and those are billion dollar bets going on there. Uh, and then you have the, the cool car, I mean, all the infotainment, the electronics, the, the amazing things going on in the car. It's gonna be a computer on wheels with movies and all the, you know, all the cool things there that's happening there. And, and not just AV, it's ADAS too. And lastly, at some point in time, these cars are gonna be connected and Lord knows flying. But, so you got all these billion dollar bets. Um, how do you at GM prioritize all that? I mean. How, do, how does it work? Give us your secret sauce, or, and then we'll get later on of, of your, well, at the end, I'll, I'll ask your personal opinion, but maybe just how do you think about the investment structure and where you focus at GM? You're right. So it all goes back to that zero, zero, zero vision of zero crashes, zero emissions, zero congestion. So when you, when you start peeling that back, you get into electrified vehicles and vehicles that are always connected. And for us, this isn't new. We've had a brand called OnStar for 25 years, right. right? Little known, OnStar returns multiple billions of dollars of revenue at very high EBIT on a yearly basis. And this is through connected services and things which are you know, part of the mobility ecosystem writ large. On the bottom side of that though is the telematics and the data that's coming off of the vehicle and to be able to understand what the vehicle is doing, not only for autonomous driving and for safety, but also for electrification, because you want to keep track of what the battery is doing. How are people driving this? What's happening in a hot climate versus a cold climate? What's happening over time? And so that data is hugely valuable so that we can understand 
the, the durability and the longevity of our vehicles. And what we're finding is our vehicles actually last a long, long time, right? And the degradation is very minor. So, so going back to zero, 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 that's, that's how we prioritize. We are all in on electrifying. In fact, uh, Mary stated very clearly, Mary, Mary Barr, our, our chairman and CEO, has stated very clearly, 2035, zero emissions in our light duty portfolio, 2040, carbon neutral in our products and our operations. This is visionary things that every day, what are we doing? What are we doing? And the thousand decisions that you take every day are really measured against that. So that's what we do, no kidding. I mean, full stop. That is, okay, I'm gonna to get to you in a second. because. So this North Star that Mary, Mary Barra put into place um, culturally at GM, um, talk about it. I mean, you do it every day. Is it, how did it happen? I mean, GM did not operate that way before, I think is a fair statement of how, I mean, maybe you had North Stars, but nothing like this that I've ever seen. Tell me, give us, peel back, peel back a couple of the secret sauces. Is it her leadership? Is it the vision? How did you do it? What it what's it about? Well, it starts with, with making sure that everyone understands very particularly why we exist. There's also being an old company there's a lot of humility that's right. built into this because when you're very public, you have things that happen in the marketplace. Some of your products are awesome hits, some of them are not, right? So at, at any point in time, you always have to be you know, humble and hungry in equal measure. And Mary's made very hard decisions about exiting markets, putting in new products, changing our entire product portfolio, shortening our product development cycle when in fact, you know, you know, the big company kind of puckers up when it's time to, you know, cut half of your development time and say we're going to do it all virtually. We are. And that's exactly the mindset that's there. It's very possible. And she makes sure that we remember that we tell ourselves it's very possible and it is happening and here's the proof points that we're delivering. So as these new products are showing up in the marketplace now, the, uh, the GMC Hummer EV, you know, the, 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 the big pickup truck. That thing is that, amazing. That and I love that here. video, by the way. Uh, have you ever seen, uh, so look on, on, on YouTube, you look up Watts to Freedom, W-A-T-T-S, Watts to Freedom. It's kind of a hidden mode inside the uh, GMC Hummer EV. You know, the, the, the point here is that there are, the, the, the products are exciting, they're compelling, and we're doing them in a much shorter time frame than we have in the past. And that's because we have two new platforms, our Ultium uh, propulsion platform, which is batteries, battery cells, and power electronics and motors that can go across our entire portfolio. And also our Altify software platform, which has actually abstracted the customer facing feature software from the deeply embedded safety critical software that actually runs the, the you know, what Chris was talking about, the, the um, uh, redundant steering redundant and braking safety. and all that stuff. So they're abstracted uh, apart and that allows us to reuse the things that we're very good at while enabling us uh, to do um, all of the things that we want to do in the future. So those two platforms together really give us the opportunity to move much more quickly and to, and to iterate the platforms as quickly as possible. And, and your focus on where you invest, that's, very, that's great, that's very quick. So Quinn, you have your North Star. First of all, tell us, you told us in the beginning what your North Star is, but how do you do it with your, your partners? And you got investors, right? They, they got to buy into this. And, and how do you stick to it? Tell, tell us how, how all that works. Sure. Uh, so we focus only on ground transportation. Uh, so things with wheels uh, and all the services related to movement of people and goods along the ground. Nothing that flies, nothing that floats. Okay. Right? So movement of, of people and goods along the surface of the earth. Uh, is, our, is our scope. We're agnostic to vehicle types, so it could be scooters, bikes, cars, motorcycles, trucks, buses, farm vehicles, so anything with wheels or, or rails and all, those, all the services related to, uh, to those vehicles, both from a consumer perspective and from a, a B2B perspective. Um, the way we do what we do, the way we form theses, uh, is we listen to large corporations uh, and what, what pain points they have as kind of the voice of the B2B customer, if you will. Uh, and a lot of corporations are saying, hey, you know, I want to I want to get involved with connectivity. I have pain points related to connectivity, autonomy, uh, shared use of vehicles, electrification and energy efficiency, and then digitization, uh, which is basically industry 4.0 and, and e-commerce using using IT to automate 
uh, a corporation's operations, whether it be transacting with a customer or supplier, or whether it be streamlining their internal operations. Let's say using computer vision. Uh, we talked about UVI earlier. Let's say using computer vision to automate some workflow in an internal operation. So we call that CASED, C-A-S-E-D. I think everyone in the room probably knows this whole ACES or CASE uh, acronym. We just add a D on the end for uh, digitization. And what we do is we're listening to corporations on one side who have these pain points, and then also listening to entrepreneurs on the other side who have a you know, dream of, of solving some of those pain points. Um, same holds true with consumers. Um, we, we all as, as consumers can feel pain related to parking your car or overpaying for insurance or getting gouged at the dealership or <laughs> getting gouged at the repair shop or physically getting into a crash and feeling pain like that. So, so we're searching for pain points uh, from businesses and consumers, we're, we're searching for entrepreneurs who are looking to solve those. And then, we, and then we want to invest into those companies that are trying to solve the pain points and serve as a bridge to help that entrepreneur then access uh, large corporations who can be their suppliers, channel partners, customers, um, uh, serve as a bridge to industry experts who can serve as, let's say, a board director at a at a startup or an advisor or C-level exec at that startup. So, so we invest and then we help the entrepreneurs uh, with talent, finding talent. We help them finding with uh, business development. We help them uh, to find uh, capital uh, as well. Uh, so we're an early stage investor. We do mainly seed and series A, so very you know, risky young, uh, young companies. We can do a little bit of mid-stage, let's say series B or C. We primarily do capital light businesses. Um, so you probably won't see us investing into the next Tesla or you know, Rivian or you know, great companies, uh, just not a fit for, uh, for our investment Rivian strategy. We want to put you know, a small amount of money into a, a company, let's say millions to tens of millions, and have it turn into something very large, as opposed to a really capital intensive uh, business model. The genius of American capitalism. I love it. So, you know, I'm a free market guy, so I love all this. Oh, back to you, Mike. How do you, how do you think about it at Flex? Obviously, these are billion dollar bets. You guys got to focus on where your engineering, your prowess. How, how do you prioritize it at Flex? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, look, um, you know, Kent gave a hint of the priorities of car companies, right? And our job is to help support uh, those companies achieve their vision. So you were talking about different acronyms. So our acronym is ACES, right? So 8S, Autonomous, Connectivity, uh, Electrification, Smart Tech are, the, are kind of our, our current businesses, a lot of uh, you know, legacy business as well that we're proud of. But the, but the real focus of, the, of, the, of where we're investing, we're growing our capability in both engineering, manufacturing, supply chain, et cetera, is in this next, next gen mobility space. So electric vehicle, scalable compute to help support the zone, domain, central compute modules you know, to support across multiple uh, different um, uh, you know, nodes of, of uh, capability. So not just autonomous and ADAS, but also you know, infotainment, body electronics, all the other elements here that make up these different domains around the car to be able to make sure that we have the right level of scalable compute solutions to help our customers with their software insert into that. And sometimes, again, as I mentioned earlier with this business model, you know, we, we do want to make sure that we're emphasizing this flexibility of not saying buy our tech or, no, or nothing, right? Like I said, sometimes we just are manufacturing, sometimes it's all us. But a lot of times, and this is the sweet spot for us right now, is working together, right? To figure out how Come to make together as teams. The, the OEMs that are wanting to develop their own technology to help them get that technology together faster. So we may be, instead of white or black box, maybe we call it gray box, right? With this collaborative uh, uh, environment that we have. So next-gen mobility, those are some of the areas, right? And, and if, you think, if you look at the growth of the market, just to put some numbers behind what uh, Kent was talking about, you know, uh, customers expect their cars to be safe. They expect this, this smartphone on wheels level of upgradability and constant updates and connectivity. And so you tie all those things together where we're looking. You know, that's from, a, from an automotive standpoint where we're putting our, our bets and making those investments. But from a flex standpoint, you know, automotive is only one sixth of the company. We're a multi-industry company. So we look at this beyond the car and really think about ecosystems beyond the car. So with the rise of electrification, need, you, you need infrastructure for that. So we have an industrial team that we partner with and we think about, you know, the, for example, some of the electric vehicle charging uh, products that they're creating and how, and how does that interact with the overall system or some of the uh, connections to grid that are being done. Uh, on the compute side, you know, massive compute in the car, 
but how does that connect to the edge to the cloud, right? So we have an enterprise computing group, all right, that is really good at putting massive compute into these different cloud systems and trying to tie some of these things together to really think about these in that. terms That's of interesting. So you interact with your fellow presidents of the different areas? Yeah, I absolutely. Take and that gets back to the culture, right, of Flex. It's a very collaborative environment, right? Yeah, so. you got to be, especially now with, with this. That, that's very insightful, actually, how, that, in, how you collaborate with them and then... Mm -hmm. And obviously, automotive should get all the money, by the way. We'll of course. Uh, there, so there yeah, you we'll, go. We'll talk all about right. that later, team. If but seriously, those type of unknown unknowns or known unknowns, and it, you know, this, this is all happening super, super fast, and it creates frustration sometimes with consumers. Um, it creates liability, too, in some cases. So how do you deal with that? And because this is happening at such clock speeds, and it really irritates, you know, the one thing that, you know, your car can be beautiful and everything else, but if the damn Bluetooth doesn't connect or the, 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 the simplistic things with the charging or the, the, the uh, ways, whatever, that drives people crazy. And if you look at the J.D. Powers surveys, that's where people are, are really falling down, right? So anyhow, open it up to the group. How the hell should we think about the bad side? Because it's not always so perfect. So anybody can take it. Can you want to start? Or? Yeah, yeah. Let me, let me, let me hit that. So um, a, couple, a couple of things are really important. And, and I want to go back to, uh, Danny, what you were talking about earlier about the synthetic data. Um, as, as we get more and more complicated, and Bluetooth is not complicated. Yeah, that's simple tech, it and is, it doesn't it really, work. It, it's really simple, but, but that's, a, that's an interesting thing because that's the intersection of a vehicle and a consumer product. And um, uh, when Chris was talking about those requirements that, that are so important that, you know, I intend to do this and you intend to do that, and, and you know, I expect you to do this and you expect me to do that, if those don't match up, you're, you're toast, right? And here's, here's the thing, if you're a vehicle OEM, it's your fault. Right. Doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't right. matter. You can't it's, look it's, at the, it's the car's fault, right? Of course. And, and so, so this is a very, this is a very interesting thing. Bluetooth is is it, it is just a, a non you know it, it's not even on the map of complexity. Okay, so now I'll start talking about AI, ML, and enabled <laughs> systems, right? Because we have to have so much information that is used to not only train the systems, but you have to reserve a portion of that to also validate the systems. And the validation, when you're doing validation by driving around, proven in use, that's a weak validation. Because you don't have the stack of variation that you're going to have in sensing, in build, that's in, in timing, um, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, the direction that we're going to be going here is the majority of the validation of these very complex systems, by definition, will be synthetic. It will be through simulation. It will be through these billions and billions of test points. And a lot of that data is actually going to be synthetically derived because you simply can't collect every data point of every, of every you know, street everywhere and have all of the different variations occurring. So I'm very glad you brought that up. That's something to keep everyone's eye on because without that, the promise of the future won't happen. Full stop. Fantastic answer. What's your view on this in terms of how you think of all, because these people you're working with are gonna wanna change the world, not just if they fail, but when, because a lot of them don't, but when it doesn't work, and people die, or, or it's an inconvenience, you know, how do you deal with that as a VC, and uh, what, do you send the troops in, or what, do you, what, do you, yeah. what do you do? Yeah, uh, uh, failure is, you know, key part, part, of, the, <laughs> is part of the game, right? right? And majority of startup companies fail. They're extremely high-risk R&D projects, is, is what they are, and they're, and they're people, they're led by people who have a very high tolerance for, for risk, and I would, I would include myself as one of those. I view myself as an entrepreneur as opposed to, of course. to, an, to an investor, a company builder who's willing to take, to take risks, and uh, that's what they do, uh, and they fail, they fail most of the time, and then some of them achieve a breakthrough, and even when they do achieve a breakthrough, there's still all kinds of flaws and bugs and uh, caveats and risks associated with that that breakthrough, but as long as you keep kind of pounding away and and keep on mitigating each of those risks, you can eventually uh, achieve kind of your end, your end goal. Um, one one thought that comes to mind is you know is a lot of corporations who who've become established and very successful have a lot to lose 
uh, and they become a little bit less willing to take massive risks because they have this wonderful profit stream and instead of people. Yeah, we were talking about that early their, on. You're right, exactly. On, on their business, but <clears throat> you know, startup companies don't have as much to lose, and so they can take big risks and big swings. Uh, as they, as a company grows from a startup into a mature corporation, um, those that are willing to still take massive risks um, tend to become um, trillion-dollar companies, right? So if you, you know, if you look at uh, let's say a Tesla, for example, still takes very big swings. If you look at the number of products that they have out there that have like the word beta in front of it, uh, and services that they have out there um, that are, you know, it, and they're, they're taking big risk and people criticize them for that. Um, and yes, a lot of people's lives are at, at risk here, um, but they also, they think it's worth, worth the risk. So I think there's other companies here in Silicon Valley and there's other companies around the world that are also still willing to take very big swings uh, despite being a massive corporation with a, with a lot to lose. Interesting. And Mike, you, I mean, because you, some of this you manufacture and it could be your reputation on the line. It doesn't always work or who you're working with. Or how do you guys think about when things don't work the way no, you're supposed to? It's a, it's a great question. So I think it really starts with, um, you know, when you think about this ecosystem approach that we've talked about, you know, there's, it does mean there's more players and that also creates opportunities to not completely specify and, va and validate the systems together. So we understand our part of this, right? So it starts with making sure that, you know, from the beginning of uh, designing a platform that we're working early, uh, for example, on compute with uh, chip suppliers. So, you know, Danny, the partnership on the DriveOrn platform, understanding early on what that looks like, building, building platforms before we have the first program to understand it so that we can help our customers utilize that technology, right? Or other chipsets that we're working with with other suppliers. Um, another thing is in terms of the manufacturing capabilities. So we use digital twin technology in our manufacturing plants extensively to try to model our plants. So we have a lot of customers that when they're ready to go to launch, you know, they want to launch soon. So we have some automotive programs that I'm, I'm hardwired to think it's three to four years. No, think nine months, right? Wow. You've got to go through a DV and a PV cycle quickly, right, for some of our customers. And, and you have to have that level of simulation work in the plants, even though it sounds maybe not as flashy as some of the examples. But that's also an element to make sure that we're building, you know, near zero, you know, uh, PPM type of quality, right, uh, as we come in, into, the, into, into the game. Same thing with our supply base, making sure that we're getting the right quality of components coming into the plant door. So that's on the manufacturing and the quality side. And then you also have the partnership element of making sure that we're working on the system integration tasks. So we have architects, even though we may not be designing all of the, you know, the high-end software stacks for autonomous driving, for example, we have architects that understand those elements so they can really very clearly understand the interface of customer software to our hardware platform and our base software, for example. So all of those things come together to try to improve the quality overall to lessen the number of those frustrating issues. But, but let's also face it, right? There's how many lines of code? 100 million lines of code in a, in a typical high-end car and growing exponentially. And that's why the thing we've talked about before in terms of this overall connectivity from edge to cloud, to be able to recognize when software issues are found that you can update and re, uh, reprogram the cars you know, on a very dynamic and regular basis, just like you have on your smartphone, right, to, to create constant updates, in addition to the new features and the other data monetization examples that we've talked about before. Okay. That's our approach. Fascinating. All right, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, I want to talk about talent. Um, everything we talked about takes enormous amount of brain power and talent and motivation. Um, in today's world, that is the commodity people are trying to get all the time. So. Maybe I'll, Michael, let me start with you on this one. How do you attract, how does, who are you looking for and how do you actually attract them? What's your, what's your pitch and, and, and thinking about that? Because you got, I'm sure uh, Kent's trying to grab people and this guy's talking to some pretty talented, I mean, so how does it work? In yeah, it's a great question. I will tell you that, um, you know, attracting the right team is so important in this area. And uh, for Flex, we're growing. You know, I know there's uh, maybe some companies that are thinking about cutting back on hiring. But we are, we are making our bet on next-gen mobility and this set of products. It's growing. Our, our growth has been pretty strong. So one of our, attract, our points of attraction, if you will, to potential candidates is to really share our vision, share how we work from a cultural perspective of uh, working together, but also letting people know that they're going to have a chance to work on some of this new technology very interactively with our customers and with our global teams and our plants and our and our product development activities. And quite frankly, we've, um, we've done fairly well in terms of attracting some really fantastic talent globally. 
And so those are a few of the things we look at. Obviously, you have partnerships with different, uh, different groups that, uh, that you know, allow us to target certain skill sets that we're looking to try to hire. Um, you know, there's so much growth, for example, in electric vehicle. For, you know, so we're, we're hiring a large team for that. And we've already hired some really uh, talented people. That's a, and you know there's certain parts of the world that it's going to be very tough to get those types of uh, yeah. team members to join. And I think that we've done, uh, I'd like to say we've done better than most, right, in terms of getting a really good team. It's interesting, and I'll go to Kent in a second. We were, my team, I had my global team in this week, and yesterday we, we talked about where we want to hire and what, what type of talent that we want to bring in, and it's, it was a fascinating discussion. We want to steal some of your people, by the way. So if anyone uh, wants to come work at KPNG for a little while, we'll, bring, we'll let you have them back, but uh, I'm, I'm serious in terms of uh, doing, doing things around differently, just thinking outside the box a little bit. But Kent, General Motors, you have, a storied history, you have a reputation because you've been in the market for so many years and you're doing so many cool things, but uh, depending who you talk to, General Motors gets, in terms of the, the marketplace of talent, will have a reaction and I think you're making great progress, but how, do, how does talent, where is that list on the, uh, for, for General Motors and how do you attract it? Uh, many of the people that are joining GM right now are actually attracted to the zero, zero, zero vision right. and, and, and are very vocal about it. They want to change society. And you, and you change society by working with big companies, right? And, and the, the opportunity to get new ideas and to, to get new capabilities in the market um, is, is thrilling to anybody, regardless of their time in the industry. And, um, you know, my number one thing is to just always remember that success can hinge on the curiosity of one individual. One individual, and you have to, you have to as, a, as a leader, you have to treat every moment as that moment where it might be the, the inflection point, right? That is great. And, and, and you really- Say it again, that is, I think it's I have so no true. idea what I just said. You just said, <laughs> you play the tape. inflection point, no, on the yeah. curiosity, I love well, so, it. So That's in, what Einstein said. So intellectual that. curiosity and this natural drive to understand and to create and not to be put off by the first time it didn't work, right? And to just, you know, kind of, keep working your way around and then surround them with people who are just as intellectually curious and capable as they are. It can all hinge on one person's moment where, where someone has to say it's possible and you can do it and then it happens. And then they're like, well, I'm surprised that that happened. I'm not, you know, and that's, and that's the beauty of having the resources and the mission and the mandate to change fundamentally what you're doing. And that's, the, and that's like turning this, this big tuna boat that's GM, right? Right. It, it, it's actually much more agile, much more fast, and, and radically transparent. There is nothing hidden inside the company. So that makes it very easy for us to say, you know, we said we were doing that last week, we're doing this now, and nobody's like, well, you know, nobody consulted me about that. No, it's, it's all just open because this is the environment in which we work. So, you know, is it different? Yes, it's, it's different, but is it unnatural? Not at all. Not at all. Wow, and for a storied company, how old is GM now, 100 and? Um, it's, it's started in the early 1900s, right? Yeah, so 120, yeah. yeah, and to be able to evolve and be around and yet. And, and, and just remember, in the, early, in the early 1900s, there were several hundred uh, automotive Motive manufacturers, companies. right? That's what General Motors was, was an aggregation of a whole bunch. Yeah. Of, uh, of, in fact, we still have uh, the Dort Durant um, uh, uh, factory in uh, Flint, Michigan, and we often have uh, retreats there where you sit and think about things, but you're just surrounded by the, the history of the company. Yeah, it, by the way, just as a sign, I'm gonna get to you in a second. We were at the Numi plant, or the Tesla, uh, right. Nelson took us around, I was just, well he didn't, but they took us around there, and uh, that was your former plant mm -hmm. in 1962 or three, I forgot. Think what, about that. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, by the way, the land, boy, Inland knows how to get a good deal. I think he bought it for 42 million, I don't know what the $900 a square foot in uh, Fremont, California is worth, but I gotta believe that's in the billions of the property, but anyhow. Uh, you know, and, and we're, we're right now weeks away from going 24 seven in our battery manufacturing joint venture with LG uh, Energy Systems in Lordstown, Ohio. So like right where automotive manufacturing is mm -hmm. and was, right, we now have a, a, a huge oh, that is cool. battery manufacturing um, site that is, you know, creating jobs in the middle of the U.S. and it's, you know, it, you, you, you're never far from the economic impact of the automotive industry in the U.S. 
Absolutely. Uh, talent. You're, you're, you see a lot of talent, but you got to, you know, how do you think about when you're looking at them as talent? What do you? Sure. Uh, so I can, I can comment on talent through a couple different lenses. So one is, uh, one is when we're investing in entrepreneurs. What type of people um, are, are we looking to invest in? I love people with superpowers. Um, I love people who have some extreme strengths in some dimension, some big spike. Uh, it happens that people with superpowers also are deficient in other ways, uh, myself, myself included, right? Um, but if you can find people with some, some superpower that's relevant to, that. uh, to their business, you know, to the kind of market opportunity that they're trying to, trying to um, exploit, um, if you can pair those people up with other uh, different superpowers, right? You suddenly get a team with a bunch of, of large spikes that are all relevant to, uh, to solving this transportation problem that they're, they're working on. So I often, I look for superpowers, I ask people about their superpowers. Oh, really? <laughs> um, and I also ask people about their deficiencies uh, and the extent to which they understand where they are, where they're deficient, so that they can go out and find other people who, uh, who kind of fill that, that void, if you will, right? And so in, in building our firm, that's exactly what I've done. I've basically recognized that I'm strong at a few things and I'm terrible at a bunch of other things. And I've gone out and I've recruited people who have strengths that I, that I lack. Uh, and I love it when, when other entrepreneurs do that uh, as well. Once we invest into, into a, a company, uh, we try to help them find people with superpowers that can come and join their team. And so we, we actually just hired uh, an awesome head of talent. Uh, his name's Tyson Bennett. He just joined us. Um, he's, he's there to not only help our firm recruit people to come and join us, we're actually, um, we have our largest hiring wave ever inside of our firm right now. We're a small firm, but we're, we're hiring for like seven people right now. So uh, it's a big time of change and growth for us as a, uh, as a small VC firm. Um, but Tyson is there to not only uh, help us recruit people to come and join us, um, but also to help our portfolio companies uh, to recruit independent board directors, advisors, mentors, and C-level executives who have those kind of superpowers that the company might presently lack. Wow, I'm going to steal. That is a great line of superpowers. That's fantastic. OK. We incorporate that uh, interview technology. One thing we, I haven't heard us mention yet is um, really creating an inclusive environment. Okay, and that's, I know, one thing that uh, when we look at talent that's coming in, obviously they want to change the world, they want to be a part of this next-gen mobility, they want to work with the best and coolest customers, but they also need an environment, right, that is, um, that is truly inclusive. And that, that's not just uh, by the numbers, but it's also in terms of how leadership is truly listening and listening to the opinion of the whole team as we go through this. So I think that's another cultural element that uh, today, the, the newer generation of workers coming into the workforce, they're expecting that, and that flexibility. So um, I think offering that is also important as we think about what's, what's the work structure of the future that allows people to collaborate in new and different ways. All right, I have one more question, and, and I know people want to, I'll take one from the, the group. So we, I kind of gave this away earlier, but, and I'll make it even a bigger number because GM is on there. So I'm going to play God here and give you money. <laughs> and it, it, where would you, if I gave a billion dollars or what, well, let's just use a billion. I know that's not a lot in GM, but personally gave you a billion dollars, okay? If it went to you, Ken, or went to you, Quinn, Mike, where would you, what would you do with the billion dollars, and you have plenty of time to spend it, and where would you prioritize that billion dollars? Go ahead, Quinn. So we, we have about a half a billion dollars. Uh, well, that right would now, double so not, you. Not quite there, but with, <clears throat> with our half a billion dollars, we've invested into, uh, into 40 companies um, over the last six and a half, seven years. Um, and we basically put our, you know, put our money where our mouth is, right? So uh, we've just recently invested into uh, an online motorbike marketplace called Mundimoto. Um, there's plenty of online car marketplaces, <clears throat> like whether it be you know, CarMax, or, uh, or whether it be Carvana, or in Europe you have a bunch, but if you look around the world, there's not that many motorbike marketplaces um, mm -hmm. that, are, that are out there. And so we just invested in Munimoto. Europeans like motorbikes more than we Americans do. Uh, they're based in Spain, so they're starting in, in Europe. <clears throat> we were also uh, investors in, in Lyft. Uh, so Lyft was founded out of my house many years ago in, in Palo Alto. I didn't um, know I, that, really. Yeah, oh, wow. yeah. Cool. and I've been an advisor to the company for ever, you know, 14, 15 years. Our fund one invested into Lyft. Um, 
and they obviously went public a number of years ago, and we're still very close with them. But we've invested into, we asked ourselves, well, what's coming you know, after Lyft and, and after Uber, right? So what's the next kind of wave in that world? And we, we invested into a company called Gridwise uh, recently that is, it's basically a tool that rideshare and gig economy drivers can use um, to manage um, their sole proprietorship. They are sole proprietors. Um, and it's to manage their income, their taxes, all the uh, services and products that they need to buy in order to run their, their business, whether it be tires or insurance or auto repair services or cell phone coverage or fuel or what have you. So, so Gridwise helps, helps these drivers to manage their, their business and helps them to access uh, services from all kinds of different vendors to uh, reduce their, their cost of doing business. Right? So that, that's another example of, uh, of, of where we're investing. We've also been doing you know, fintech, whether it be insurance, Oh, auto really? repair Pit loans, okay. um, uh, truck insurance, um, motorhome rentals. We're investors in Outdoorsy, which is uh, uh, the number one kind of Airbnb for motorhomes uh, company out there. So Fascinating stuff. And you would just, of course, accelerate now and give you all that money, or at least do more longer, I guess. So fascinating. Fascinating. All right, Ken, I know that's not a lot of money in GM, but if I gave it to you personally. <laughs> so uh, the, the magic wand, right? So this is... What I would invest in, and this is going to sound trite, but it's not, I'd invest in thoughtful people. And I would bring them together and, and put them in this big maker space and bring you know, entrepreneurs and startup companies and just kind of keep reshaping that with very finite duration. Now, this sounds a lot like my job, right? which, it, which in fact it is, but um, I would do it in a, in, a, in a different scale and in a different fashion. Um, and, and really try to prove out the idea of open innovation really working in perpetuity. Mm. And frankly, this idea of the mixing and matching, it's got a spotty record of being successful. And I would spend one to two years max trying to figure out how to crack that code. Interesting. That's what I would do. Interesting. And how would you just... How would you select the people to come in? What would you? Uh... Oh, that's a long. That's a lot. Okay. I'm gonna, I'd call Quinn. You call Quinn to get. Yeah. This. Yeah. Exactly. You get like, yeah. You bring <laughs> exactly. in. Physi would you bring physicists in and molecular engineers and it is chemists? The, it and... is the most amazing thing when you bring in people who are physicists who have a business bent, or you have people who uh, all they think about is gas expansion. No, no kidding, right? Entropy, and, and, baby. And, 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 and what I've learned is smart is fungible, always. And so you put an impossible problem in, in front of smart people, and it's like oxygen and food, you know? And, and, and they, just, they just go berserk. What? And I would love to be able to have more of, more of that. So that's what I do. So, so can I sign you up? But there you go. I'm, I'm there. I'm there. There you go. I would love to, by the way. That's something I love to do, by the way. That is what a cool, a very cool answer. Incredible answer, actually. I did not see that one. That is a great. That is very interesting. Very cool. Um, Mike, you got a, that's a tough one to follow there. Uh, oh my I, can't God. Follow, I can't follow that uh, exactly. But I will say this, that uh, on behalf of the three of us, we appreciate the $3 billion investment that KPMG has made <laughs> in our companies. And um, Mike thank Chairman, you so much. Uh, I'm going to get an email here in a minute. <laughs> All right, exactly. All right, so look, you know, from our standpoint, this, it's a great question, right? Um, you know, Flex has, we've invested in acquisitions, we've invested in startups. Not startups just for technology's sake, but also identifying future customer startups, right? Um, so there's a few uh, car companies that we have some great business with today, right, that were risks that we took at some point. So finding a few more of those future awesome customers in this next-gen mobility space would be one part of it. I think the other part of it is to fill in some of the gaps, right? That, I mean, no, we, nobody should be, try to be all things to all people in this ecosystem approach, right? Because you can't, you can't do it, but we'd like to strengthen you know, the depth of our electric vehicle portfolio uh, from an electronics perspective, the depth of really trying to solve some of the roadblocks that uh, the car companies are having to really monetize uh, all of these investments that they're making with their design. So it has to be cost effective, right? It truly has to be scalable so that when you have a platform, you know, all the way from the highest end vehicles within the lineup to some of the more entry level vehicles that you can really leverage some of the same architecture and there's investment required in that. So maybe not as exciting, but it's an enabler, okay, to accelerating the technology to the point where a car company that maybe is only limited based on their capability is launching a new platform every six months or nine months. Well, what if in the future we could, we could enable them, okay, through, you know, standard scalable platforms to launch every three months, 
with the existing level that of capabilities That would be a game changer, have. yeah. It's a game changer and hopefully it can really help enable uh, our customers to go to market faster, more robust, to try to take advantage of those trend lines that we talked about earlier, safety, sustainability, um, and uh, robustness. All right, well with that, I wanna give these people a round of applause. This was absolutely awesome. <laughs>